Ephesians chapter 1, Lord willing, we'll finish up the chapter this morning as we continue through our rotation of Genesis, Psalms, Luke, or Mark, and Ephesians. And um, it's kind of, it's always a little bit difficult for me because this morning I was looking ahead to Genesis 13, which is where we'll be next week. So it's sometimes it's hard to keep my mind on the track of where we're at instead of thinking ahead to where, Lord willing, we're going to be. But we're going to finish, Lord willing, Ephesians 1 this morning. And You know, I grew up a, a huge sports fan. Uh, sports has always been a, a great passion of mine. Uh, I always tease people and say, the first two things I learned to read as a child was the Bible and box scores. You know, uh, it, young people, it wasn't like it is today. You don't get instant box scores as you click on the internet. You don't get instant updates. When we were young, we had to wait for the next morning newspaper to find out what had happened in the games the night before. And sometimes it was so frustrating that if it was a late game, that information wouldn't even be in the next morning's paper. It would just put late game and you had to wait for the next day because there wasn't any internet at the time. But um, the reason I say that is because I'm always fascinated at uh, how a game can always come down, not always, but a lot of games come down to the last play. Right, last night at Tech, the Tech game, the men's game came down to the very last play. They played a hard-fought sixty minutes of basketball, but the whole thing came down to the very last play of the game, and uh, that 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 always amazes me because it's almost like, well, you you know, you think in hindsight we could have just skipped all that other part and just got down to the last play of the game, you know. But really all that is, is it was a summary of the game. For example, last night, if I were to summarize the Tech men's game, played well at the beginning, played crummy through the middle and towards the end, played great at the end, lost the lead at the very end, but they got the last play of the game to go in their favor. That's as simple as I can put it, and they won the game. Now, you could have sat there, like Lloyd and I were sitting there watching the game last night, and a lot of other stuff went on. I mean... Trust me, a lot of stuff, other stuff went on. Not quite sure what was going on with those officials if you were at that game last night, but about 27 times they had to check the replay. Now, we're glad they got the calls right, I suppose, but what I'm trying to say is a lot of times a lot of stuff goes on in a ball game, but it can be summarized really succinctly. You can just sum it up, and sometimes you can sum it up by the last play of the game. So that's what I want to do with this last part of Ephesians chapter 1. A lot of stuff going on here in Ephesians chapter 1. And if I were to take you through every bit of it, you would be like, okay, let's get back to Genesis. Let's get back to Psalms. Let's get back to Mark. Because as I said, Paul was very lawyerly in his, in his speech and... Uh, a lot of times, sentences run together, and uh, you're not quite sure what Paul's trying to say. So I'm going to try and be as succinct as possible this morning and tell you there's three things Paul's trying to conclude Ephesians 1 with. The first one is this, what Paul desires us to have. The second one is this, how this is accomplished. And the third point is, what are the results of what he desires for us to have? Now, what does Paul desire us to have in these verses? Well, the title of the message this morning is Holy Spirit, Illuminate Us. Illuminate Us. What that basically means is, Holy Spirit, turn on the lights of our minds. Turn on the lights of our souls. Turn on the spiritual understanding in our eyes. Turn on the spiritual understanding in our souls. So the point of this last part of Ephesians chapter 1 is Paul wants the Holy Spirit to illuminate us, to enlighten us. And by doing this, we get several things. I want to look at these real quickly. The first one is found in verse 17. Paul says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. So the first thing that Paul wants us to receive through this illumination is the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. The second thing he longs for us to have through this power of the illuminating spirit is in verse 18. He wants our eyes, the eyes of our understanding, to be enlightened. 
He wants the light bulbs to go off in our spiritual light bulbs to go off in our heads. He wants us to be able to sit down and read God's Word and and have understanding of God's will for our lives and what God wants for us and what God expects of us and how God expects us to worship Him and how God expects us to treat others, how God expects us to be kind to everyone, including unbelievers that are hostile to us and to the Word of God. God expects us to love our enemies so that through our love, they might see the love of Jesus Christ. So God, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, wants the eyes of our understanding and light. He wants the spiritual light bulbs to go off in our heads and in our hearts. He also wants us in verse 18 to know the hope of God's calling. He wants us to understand what God has called us to do. He wants us to understand what God has called us to. An eternal inheritance. An eternal uh, home with Him forever. Where we will never die. Where there will be no more pain. No more sorrow. No more suffering. No more death. No more winters. No more cold weather. No more snow. I know that makes some of you very, very happy. Paul wants us to know the hope of God's calling through this illuminating power of the Spirit. Then fourthly, he wants us to know the riches of the glory of God's inheritance in us, as we also see in verse 18. He wants us to know just, let me summarize that. Again, it's a little wordy, so let me just put it this way. He just wants us to know how glorious it is to be a Christian. He wants us to know that there is no greater life to live than the life of a Christian. And it doesn't mean that it's all roses. Sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes we go through pain. And sometimes we go through suffering and heartache and loss. Just because we're Christians does not make us exempt from the tribulation and trials that we have all around us. But it's better to have Jesus Christ on our side than the alternative. And that's what Paul wants us to know through the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to know the riches of God's inheritance in us. And then the final thing he wants us to to know that we have is to know, verse 19, what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us word who believe according to the working of His mighty power. God desires for us, and the Apostle Paul makes this clear in verse Uh, 19, that God has a great power, a power that's greater than anything any man can imagine. And that power is experienced through the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. And as we are in obedience to God's commands, and as we follow God's will, we begin to understand what that power is in our life. We begin to understand the power that God has, the power over all things, the power over sin, over death, over hell, the power over the grave, the power over tribulation and trials and temptations and heartache. These are all things that none of us desire. And yet God says, I have the power over all these things and I want you to know these things. Now, these five things that we've made mention of in verses 17 through 19 that Paul desires us to have through the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit, these are wonderful things. And this is the key to these five things and the key to this first point before we move on to point number two. I want you to get this about these five things. They're wonderful. They're worthy. These things should be the desire of our hearts. These five things are worthy of our deepest thoughts and meditations and admiration. And these five things are beyond the power of natural man to comprehend and understand. Let me say that again. These five things are beyond the power of the natural man to comprehend and understand. In other words, unregenerate men cannot take these things that Paul desires for us to have and say, oh, I long for those things. They don't. The unregenerate man, they they do not long for these things that the illuminating, illuminating power of the Holy Spirit brings to us. The unregenerate man would rather have his sin. The unregenerate man would rather have his darkness, as we talked about last Sunday morning. The unregenerate man would rather have his um, anything that he can possibly gather. Uh, than, it, than to have these things from God's 
Word. So, we have to understand very quickly this morning that without the Spirit of God, these five things that Paul desires us to have, these five things that Paul desires for us to know about God, they're impossible to us because the unregenerate man wants nothing to do with the things of God. So they are supernatural things. They're supernatural things. It's it's amazing to me that when it comes to Christianity, the secular world will scoff at us for believing in the supernatural. But yet, if you turn on about one out of every two television shows, if you go see about one out of every three or four movies in theaters today, you know what the main theme of those shows and movies are? The supernatural. It's amazing that they scoff at us when we think about the supernatural, when we talk about the supernatural, but yet that is the theme of entertainment. Why are zombies such a big thing in today's society? I don't know. <laughs> you tell me, because I haven't figured it out. You know, But it's a phenomenon that has spread through America, this walking dead. Just that ver- that title alone. The Walking Dead. Oh, so we can believe that zombies are alive today and that they roam the earth. But we talk about a risen Savior, the God-man who came to this earth, who rose again from the dead to defeat death, hell, and the grave. And, and we're wackos. It makes no sense, does it? Now, I'm not saying you can't watch that. I would be very careful with some of it. I really would. But... Um, it just it blows my mind to think about uh, the supernatural and, and how we are laughed at for believing in it, and yet it is so prevalent in our society today. But the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God must reveal these things to our hearts and our minds. You know, it would be like me, without the Spirit of God illuminating us and regenerating us, it would be like me handing you... Uh, uh, the doctor's tour, tools and saying, I need some surgery on my heart. Now go to it. Sorry, but that's not ever going to happen, okay? As far as I know, we don't have any uh, uh, physicians in here uh, this morning. And if you're a nurse, if you're a nurse, I'd be more prevalent to, to, to head towards you this morning. But, you know, if I'm going to have open heart surgery, I would like to have a heart doctor, right? Work on me, wouldn't you? Am I, am, I, am I saying something that wouldn't, we wouldn't all desire? So to, to understand these things without the Spirit of God is the same way. It would be like us just trying to perform open heart surgery on someone with absolutely no understanding of how to do that. It would be like me bringing my Greek New Testament to church and starting to read from the Greek New Testament on Sunday mornings. Or my Hebrew Old Testament and reading from the Hebrew Old Testament on Sunday mornings. You guys would look at me like I was crazy. Why would you do that? You might be thinking. And that's exactly, you know, for you to understand that without the Spirit of God, without the Spirit of Christ, is the same way for us to try and understand these things that Paul is talking about. So point number one, what the, what Paul desires for us to have. The short answer, okay, again, the succinct, the summarized answer, it all comes down to one play, okay? It's the illumination of the Spirit. So, on to point number two then. How does this illumination of the Spirit happen? How is this accomplished? Well, it's accomplished really in two phases. First of all, it's regeneration. And secondly, it's sanctification. God works. God's Spirit illuminates. God's Spirit uses the Word of God to enlighten our hearts. How does God regenerate souls? How does God quicken souls? How does God take individuals that are dead in trespasses and sin and make them alive? The Bible says in Romans 10 and verse 17, hey, that sounds familiar. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. How does God bring the dead to life? He does so by the preaching of the Word of God. He does so by His Word. We read it in Ezekiel chapter 37. How did the dry bones live? The dry bones live because God told the prophet Ezekiel 
to prophesy the word of the Lord to the dry bones. Now, you know the Bible calls preaching foolishness. And if you think about it, it's the foolishness of God. It's foolishness in a good way. But if you think about it, the world looks at us and they think, they go to church, they listen to this guy stand up for 20, 30, 40 minutes, however long, and he's just telling them things over and over and over. And to the world, it's just pure foolishness. Why do I need to hear that? And sometimes when I stand up here, sometimes it feels kind of foolish from time to time. Because I'm thinking, you know, they've heard this stuff over and over and over again. But you know one thing God's never asked me to do? God's never asked me to go to a pile of dead, dry bones and preach the Word of God to a pile of dead, dry bones. I think a lot about those prophets. I have a lot of respect for those prophets. What God asked them to do. I mean, I'm not trying to be irreverent or blasphemous. But God asked some of those prophets to do some pretty crazy things. You know, Isaiah to uh, Ezekiel was to lay on his side for so many days, and then lay over on his other side for so many days. And Isaiah was to roam around at one point naked, proclaiming the word of the Lord. Not quite sure I understand that one, but there's some things we just won't understand till we get to glory. Amen. <laughs> and that's all right with me. And uh, I, there's a lot of things that the prophets. But they were all pictures. They were pictures of what God was doing, you see. They were uh, 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 signs of what, what God was doing. And for Ezekiel to go and preach a bunch of uh, dead, dry bones had to be a little awkward. I remember a time my brother was uh, living in Nashville with his family and he was trying to help get a church started there and there was just two families there. It was my brother's family and it was the pastor's family. And he invited me to come speak one Sunday. Basically, I was preaching to my brother, my sister-in-law, and their children. That's just a little awkward. It really is just a little odd. Now, I don't know why, because, you know, every, every evening we try to have family devotions. And, and my family will tell you, well, that's what he does to us every evening. He just preaches at us. But, you know, something's just a little strange. It's, what I'm trying to say, it's nice to have a group full of people to preach to. A group full of people that are alive, right? That are awake and alive, unlike that valley of the dry bones. I don't want to preach to a bunch of dry bones, right? But what was it that brought those dry bones to life? It was the preaching of God's Word. Why? Because the preaching of God's Word is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You see, this is a, this is a matter of power. And if we think that we can receive these things that Paul desires for us to have, this illumination without the Spirit of Christ, we're dead wrong. We're dead wrong. Let me give you an example of what that would be like. That would be like Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble getting in their little car and racing against a NASCAR driver. Who's going to win that race? Huh? <laughs> Come on now, you all remember Fred Flintstone. Don't don't make me do my little illustration and start kicking my feet because I'll hurt myself. But you've got one vehicle that's powered by feet. You've got another vehicle that's powered by these, uh, I don't know, somebody help me out. How many horsepowers are in those NASCAR? I don't know. But a lot of power. A lot of horsepower. There is no competition. That NASCAR would just leave old Fred and Barney in the dust. And when it comes to the power of regeneration, if we think it's in our own power, we're just as foolish as if we think Fred and Barney could pass a NASCAR car. Okay? Does that make sense? Well, I've got to bring this to a close this morning. And there really was a lot in here that, um, surprise, surprise, that I'm not able to get to this morning. Um, But God regenerates. God, by His, by the... Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. He brings us out of darkness into light. That's called regeneration. But then, it's the process of sanctification. And that's what all of us in here who are believers, who are Christians, every day that we live, we go through the process of sanctification. That's God washing us every day. That's God cleansing us every day. That's God making us more Christ-like every day. 
And this is where we could really stop for a while and really ask ourselves, are we following God's word? Let me re- reiterate this before I close this morning. Without God's word, there is no regeneration. Without the power of God's word, without the power of the spirit, there is no illumination. There is no regeneration and there is no sanctification. So when you're thinking on that verse this week, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, I want you to think about this one fact. The hearing of the word of God in your life is just as essential for you today as it was when you were a lost individual. So well, how can that be so? When I was lost, I needed to hear the word so I could become a Christian. You're right, you did. And we did. But as a Christian, we need to hear that word every single day so that we can grow in knowledge. And these things that Paul desires for us to have become a reality in our life. We begin to understand more about the power of God. We begin to understand more about the knowledge of Christ. We begin to understand more about the things of God. So basically, again, it's coming down to the last place. So let me just summarize real quick and be real succinct. If we neglect this in our lives... There will be no sanctification. Okay? You say, well, now you're meddling, preacher. Well, no, I'm not. I'm just preaching the truth. So if we neglect God's Word, and that you say, well, I'm feeling a little bit of conviction here. Remember what I think about conviction. I think it's a good thing. It is a good thing. If we're convicted about how we neglect God's Word through the week, let's not get angry about it. Let's not, let's not get our feelings hurt about it. Let's do something about it. And let's say, alright, this week we're going to focus on so faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So this week I'm going to, I'm going to get up in the mornings and I'm just going to read a little passage of my Bible or I'm going to read a little passage of my Bible at lunchtime. Or I'm going to read a little passage at the, after dinner or, or right before bed. It doesn't matter when you do it. It matters that you do it because we all need God's Word to soak into our heart just as much as we did before we were Christians. Just as much. You see, we need the Gospel just as much today as we did before we were Christians. Because the gospel is what sanctifies. Well, I don't even have time, really. I know that I'm not sure what the weather's doing out there, so I'm going to stop there. There, there, there are some wonderful things that um, come from understanding that that this is all about God's power. There's some wonderful things in our lives that come from um, the illuminating power of the Spirit. Some of those things, the fruit of the Spirit begins to be born in our lives. And we begin to intercede in prayer for others. We sang a lot about prayer this morning. That praying for others, that comes from the illuminating power of the Spirit. Why in the world would you pray for someone else if you weren't a born-again Christian? You know, who seriously desires and, and wants that person going through a hard time to come out of that. You hear a lot of that, well, we're praying about you. We're thinking about you. But really, if you think about it, are we interceding on the behalf of others? Are we really praying? This stuff comes from the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit. There's much that could be said, but we'll close there and let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit. We thank You for regeneration, that which makes us alive, the preached Word of God, the, the Word of God that opens our eyes to, be, to, to see the beauty of Christ and we turn from our sin and we turn to Christ. And we are thankful for sanctification that comes from the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit. That sanctification that uh, as the, the Spirit shows us from Your Word the truth and it shows us from Your Word how we are to live and how we are to obey Your will and how we are to follow You. And we desire that more and more every day. And then all of a sudden, these things that Paul desires for us to have, these things begin to become a reality in our lives. So help us to remember this very week. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. May we respond now as we close. In Jesus' name, Amen.